Now, Sally's joined me at the table. I'm not going to call it a big Don't table. Call it a big table. You always laugh when I say that. It is a big table. Because it goes nuts when you say that. But what it talk. means is that look at all the papers ranged in front of us. It's time to have a look at what headlines that there are around the world. Let's kick off with this. This is in Le Figaro. It leads on that story about the former French president Nicolas Sarkozy and his angry response to being charged with corruption. Monsieur Sarkozy accuses the justice system of trying to block his return to politics. Now, the Wall Street Journal reports on global companies preparing for the possible end of sanctions against Iran. It says many firms, such as energy giants, such as Total, Royal Dutch Shell and others, are drawn to what could become the largest market in the Middle East. In the Financial Times, Britain's government curbs on highly skilled migrants have shrunk the country's pool of international talent available to businesses. That's their, that's their headline there. Business section of The Independent reports on a British Conservative MP attacking the city watchdog for not investigating an alleged manipulation of closing share prices. And there's this in the Japan Times. It's looking at how dementia is taking its toll on family life there. It says Japan is faced with a rapidly ageing population where one in four people over 65 suffer from some form of the condition. And do real men wear lycra? <laughs> so asks the Times. It takes a look at the cycling outfit culture of Britain as more cyclists swap everyday clothes for the skin tight body suits. You should be glad I didn't think about slipping into mine today for well, this Well, I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. It might boost our know, ratings, Roger. I doubt that very much. <laughs> OK. Joining us to discuss some of these very important issues is Pear Wimmer, who's the CEO of Wimmer Financial. Pear, thanks very much for coming. We'll get on to Good Lycra morning, in a minute. <laughs> uh, but first, let's start off by talking about this story about Nicolas Sarkozy. He's been you know, out of the headlines, back in the headlines now, perhaps for the wrong reasons. He's thinking about a possible political comeback. Uh, but this could be quite damaging to that. It could. And I think, I guess, the, the first point here to observe is that uh, all politicians have to be subject to the all same rules and regulations that you and I have to be subject mm. to. And I think that's, that's, uh, there can be a tendency in some places that uh, they are considered to be above the law or they can get away with other things. So I guess that's the first principle. The flip side of that is that they should also be treated as innocent before proven guilty and they should have the same rights. And I guess this is exactly what Zarkos is fighting back against. He's saying, because, you know, I was president and you don't want me to come back into politics, you, the institutions, the, the government, are using everything, including the judiciary system, to prevent me from doing so. Mm. And if that's right, then he's got a point. Just on that point, I was just looking at some figures. Uh, a, a poll of French voters, or French people, saying that 63% of them say that he's not being treated unfavourably, just being treated like any other French person in this matter. Right. Just talk, you know, just talking it's on a that question point. of trust, though, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, whilst this is all going on, you know, from the point of view of the general public in France, do they trust what Sarkozy is saying, i.e., you know, there's, there's some mudslinging going on here, or, and he's saying, I don't trust the judiciary. It's a, it's a difficult situation to play out, isn't it? And it highlights that, you know, in politics, the issue of trust is paramount. Absolutely, and it's just yet another example of why people are getting tired of politicians in, in general when these stories keep emerging about corruption and scandals, etc. It, it doesn't build trust in the, in, in the French population. Mm, OK, let's move on to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is an interesting story. Uh, potentially huge market in the Middle East centred around Iran. This is obviously something that you're going to be looking at quite a lot of, isn't Well, it? it's something we've covered quite a bit yeah. already as well, because as soon as uh, discussions between Iran and other countries began about its uh, nuclear program, etc., and, uh, you know, it's that, that sort of era of Iran being out of the international scene for so many decades seems to be coming to an end. Immediately, companies are knocking on the door, aren't they, for potential business? Absolutely, and rightly so, because Iran is a huge market. It's got 80 million people, a lot of uh, very young, well-educated and uh, hungry people for consumption, because now the floodgates of consumption are finally opening. And also, let's not forget, Iran is actually a fairly wealthy country. It's got the second largest oil reserves in the world, 
and the and the oh, sorry the fourth largest oil reserves in the world and the second large gas reserves in the world. So it's a it's a potentially very wealthy country with a young educated uh, population. So no doubt uh, the likes of particularly the French companies who used to be there, uh, Peugeot, uh, Citroen, etc. They all all come knocking on the door because there's a big market here. And, and Iran really wants the business because its economy has really been hit by sanctions. And the sanctions all obviously depend on a deal on the nuclear issue happening in July. You know, if it doesn't happen, then all this is off the table. But the companies are kind of right at the door already, kind of hungry to get in there as soon as they get the green light. Absolutely. You've got, you got to get in. And no doubt the winds are in, in their favour because of the changed political landscape. I mean, politics in, the, in Iran have changed 180 degrees because of what's happened in, in, in Iraq. So, and the companies, they realise that. So they're right there, ready to roll in. Do, is there ever a, a, perhaps a, a risk for companies being so eager to do business with uh, a government that many see as a kind of pariah state? Is there, any, is there a risk that them be looking too eager to do business there, or, is it, or does no one really care about that? They just think it's about the business. Well, it comes down to the sanctions. So when the sanctions were, were in place and, and when Iran was sort of the enemy and was uh, part of the axis of evil, then, yeah, there is definitely a risk because if you do enter into business there, we see what happens to some of the banks in particular has been active there. Uh, however, once the sanctions have been taken away because of the changed political landscape, that suddenly our new, uh, our enemy's enemy is now our best friend, which is the case here with, with Iran, everything changes. So mm. there's been a 180 degree change in, uh, on the policy of Iran and commercial uh, business people, they've certainly realised that and they're mm. ready to roll in. Mm. Now just tell us about what the Financial Times is highlighting this morning. Visa curbs on highly skilled migrants hit UK talent pool. What's going on here? Yeah, so there's been a, a lot of debate in the UK about uh, curbing uh, non-EU immigrant workers into the UK. And uh, clearly that policy, which has been in, in effect, effective since 2011, is working. Um, there's been a reduction of 39% of skilled workers coming from outside the EU into the UK. And, uh, and vice versa, there's been an increase of 53% of uh, EU skilled workers coming to the UK. So the policy is clearly working. The question we can ask here is though, is, is it good or is, is, it, is it too hard? Because sometimes companies such as my own, I find it very difficult to attract uh, or find the right talent because we, we just can't get a whole of enough talent uh, from the UK or EU pool. We need to get some skilled workers from outside, from emerging markets where there's a lot of talent available. Because you hit the cap, you hit the kind of quota cap on visas and you can't get any more visas. That's I right. know kind of in America as well, this is a really big issue for Silicon Valley companies that have been crying out for years for America to ease restrictions on the number of visas it can be hand, they, they can give out or they can get for foreign workers to come over there because you know, they're obviously paying big bucks to get the brightest computing brains and they can't bring them in because Absolutely. of the visa problems. And you don't want to put the UK in a too much of a disadvantage here. So um, something for the politicians to think about. Now, we've just got two minutes. We've got to whistle through the next few bad bankers in the headlines again. What is this one about? What is this latest accusation from, uh, from Mark Garnier, who used to be an investment banker, is now a Tory MP? Well, this relates to uh, on, the, on the London Stock Exchange, just before you, you do the close of the day, there can be an, a number of orders that comes into the system, both at, at various brokers and therefore into the LSE system, uh, with sort of final trades or, or, or hit the bit on the close, etc. So therefore, there can be a little bit of funny movements around the close. Now, some of that is not necessarily manipulation. It's just a reflection of, I need to get my order done by, the end, by, by today. Uh, but it does mean that sometimes the share prices can bump around and therefore your actual final closing price becomes uh, a little bit different to what it might Has have been five minutes earlier. Has he got a point? Um, partially. Um, there's there's re legitimate reasons for why you want to get your orders finished at the end of the day, but it's certainly something to watch. This story then on the Japan Times talks about uh, you know another issue affecting Japan, not just an ageing population and a reducing workforce, but the effects of ageing. One in four people, one in four families affected by the problem of dementia. Yeah, this is obviously a huge problem, and in particular in Japan where the uh, uh, population is ageing. Uh, but one out of four, I mean, that's, that's a lot. About 65 have got some sort of dementia problem. There's five million people we're talking about. It's, it's a big problem. And the problem is uh, uh, it's made even worse by the fact that the, the, uh, the, the hospital system there cannot cope with it, so therefore the burden falls on, on the uh, families. 
Now let's talk about mammals. <laughs> Middle-aged men in lycra is a saying <laughs> known in the <laughs> UK. Apparently we're cycling crazily and on, on Monday, the Tour de France is coming through London. Your thoughts? Amazing that, uh, that that would happen. Who would have thought Tour de France would be Tour de Britain? But uh, I guess Are you a middle-aged man in Lycra? Uh, I'm not in Lycra, I'm afraid. <laughs> just <a middle> <laughs> we'll just be middle-aged. Don't, middle yeah. don't be afraid. Okay. I don't think there's something point, to be afraid about. <laughs> Pair Wimmer, thanks very much for joining us. On that point, we'll leave it there. Thanks for joining us as well. See you soon. Have a good day. Bye-bye.